We have previously forge welded two horseshoes into a ring and made three legs for a trivet. Welcome back to Black Bear Forge, where I hope to educate, inspire, and spark the imagination of anyone interested in traditional blacksmithing. Today I thought we would go ahead and finish that trivet. The major components are done, we just need to attach the legs to the ring. The critical thing about this is that we get them evenly spaced. If it's not evenly spaced, it may look funny. If they're really off, it may be a little bit tippy and not sit right. So it's important that we get these at even thirds around the circle. What are some of the methods we can use to calculate even thirds on a round ring? Now certainly one way to do this would be to measure the ring. It's seven and a half inches on the outside, but what matters is halfway in between. You always want to do these measurements on the center line. This is three quarters of an inch thick on both sides. So you subtract three quarters or three eighths from each side to figure out just how long, wide the ring actually is or what the diameter of the center line actually is. So that would be seven and one eighths inch. So seven and an eighth is 7.125 inches. Yes, I know if you're using the metric system, this is probably a little bit simpler to calculate, but since I'm in the US and this is the way things are done, and all my tools are in imperial measurements. That's what we're going to go ahead and use for this. And you can uh, do the conversions. But don't worry about my ring size. If you're making one of these, you've got to measure your ring size. So the next thing we need to know is what is the distance around the ring? If we know it's 7.125 inches, we can take that number and multiply it times pi. Pi is the secret number in figuring out areas of circles or circumferences of circles and that will tell us that this circle is 22.3725 inches around. And to find even thirds we just divide that by three and we end up with 7.4575. That's kind of a hard number to actually measure and especially if you're trying to run your tape measure around the circle you could measure a piece of wire that length, bend it to match the circle and use that for your layout. But is that really the easiest way to do this? It really isn't. And blacksmiths haven't been doing those calculations all of eternity, and they've been pretty good at making things match. I have marked one point here that I will consider to be where one of my mounting holes is, and I have a pair of compasses or dividers. I refer to these more as compasses because Mr. Peter Ross refers to them as compasses, and apparently that was the historical term even though most people today think of it as a pair of dividers. And I'm going to march off what I think are three equal center points and come back. And that doesn't quite match. I'm about a half inch off of my mark here. I need to extend this just a little bit. I'm only going to move this up about a quarter of an inch and open it a little bit more. I'm going to start right back at my original hole or point. I haven't actually drilled a hole there. March this off in the centers again. Oh, this time I'm a little bit too long. So it doesn't take much of an adjustment. And you just do this by trial and error. You might get by with two or three times. It might take a half dozen times. But when it comes out even, and that's pretty good right there, then you know those are your even thirds. So I'm going to make a mark for that one. I've already got a mark for this one. And I got a mark for this one. And it just so happens that these two side marks land right in one of the existing nail holes. That isn't good prior planning, that's just plain dumb luck. So the next thing I want to do is I want to punch these out, or in this case I'm practically just going to be drifting it. I'm going to try and punch it and leave a nice clean hole here, but we'll punch these. I'll center punch this so I know where it is, and then we will have our three holes. So I need to go light a fire in the forge, and we need to get on with this. By the way, part of what I'm doing today is testing another new microphone that I hope 
will make the shop sounds not quite so annoying. This forge is really whiny over the old microphone, so we're going to find out if it still screams as loud over this one. It's not bad in person, it's just the microphone picks it up as being really loud. That and it was uh, really rainy last night, everything is super wet, so this may be hard to get the forge lit. But we will find out. Well, that took just a little while to get going, but we now have a good fire. We should be able to get this project completed. We're just going to worry about heating one little whole area at a time. We don't need to get the whole ring hot for this. So make sure you find your center punch mark and get your punch centered over the center punch mark. And go ahead and punch some holes. Yes, you could certainly drill these. There's no reason why not other than this is a blacksmithing exercise, not a drilling exercise. But the punch hole will be ever so slightly stronger in theory because it removes less material than a drill bit does. So I would then test this with your rivet, make sure it fits. Let's get the next one hot. Now these where the nail holes are will go real easy because there's a crease in the shoe right there plus the nail hole so there's even less material to take out. Now there's one other thing we should do to these holes before we call them done. The rivets on these should be flush, so you should countersink these, and you can either use something like this, which is called a bob punch, which is essentially just a hot counter punch, although that's a little big for this, but you can see it's shaped the same angle as a counter punch. You can probably get in there with a little ball punch. Just create a recess for your rivet head so that your rivet head will be flush when you're done and not a raised rivet head that'll make your pot sit funny. So I need to go back and do that to this one. And I can say this ball punch really does a pretty good job of this. It doesn't need to be anything huge. This is not a super high strength application, but it does still pay to check that because you've just squished some material into the hole. So make sure your rivet still fits. That crease and nail hole is shifted a little to the outside, so I'm trying to bring this punch further in, get it more centered on the ring. See if there's enough heat left. Give it a little countersink. The rivet will also fill up that crease a little bit on these, so you need even less material than you do on the flat side. Okay, that's going to work just fine. Now you might need to take one more heat and flatten this if it's way off. You can do some flattening cold, and I think, I think we're in pretty good shape here. So the ring is done. We just need to let that cool and rivet on some legs. Now for our three legs, we had originally put an upset on the end of the foot. After mocking it up, I decided I didn't like that, so I have filed that off and filed a little bevel on the three edges that are left here. And I think I like that better. I'm going to run those through the fire and clean up the edges that have been filed with the bevel and make it black. I've also cleaned up these to make these all the same length and done that with a file so we'll also run that through the fire. 
wire brush it real quick and that's really about all those need and once everything is cool we can assemble the the trivet Good time to make sure everything is straight. So we've got a nice ring and some legs. A little bit floppy without the rivet set, but yeah, you get the idea. So the next thing to do is to set these rivets. How long of a rivet do you want? The typical rule for a round head rivet is one and a half times the diameter of the rivet extra. So for a quarter inch rivet, that would be three eighths extra material besides what goes in the hole. But these are gonna be flush head rivets, so they don't need quite as much material. But these holes are a little bit floppy because we punched them and we're gonna need some extra material to try to fill those holes. So right now, these are about 3 eighths too long. If I use a one inch rivet, I could grind an eighth inch off, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and go with these and see what happens. If they stick up a little bit above the trivet when I'm done, I can file them off flush, that's easy. If I don't have enough to fill the countersink and my legs are floppy, then I've got problems. So I'd rather go with just that slightly longer rivet and it would, probably pay to do a test hole, but since I've only got three of these to do, I'm just going to test the theory right here on the trivet. So I've got three of these. I've got three legs. Now these are quarter inch rivets. We could set these cold, but I'm going to set them hot. I'm going to use a torch and heat them up because that way as they cool, they will constrict and shrink and that will pull them even tighter and that way it, the legs will be good and tight. What you don't want on your finished trivet is legs that wobble and wibble a little bit. And that's why on this one that the guys did at the conference, they went ahead and did square holes. So even if the rivet is not as tight as it could be, these legs can't twist. So square holes would certainly be an option if you want to take the time to do square holes and make square rivets. Now before we uh, tested the rivets, I made sure all the legs were the same length, still had the same angle on the top of them. Since I did a little bit of messing around with them, I made sure they were all still good. So let's do the rivets. Now you can put a rivet header under these, there's certainly no reason why not, but I don't really care if I have a perfectly round rivet, and I think it's gonna be easier to just set that right there at the anvil and it'll be more secure. So that's what we're gonna do. And I'm gonna get the torch. I'm gonna hope my arm is not in the way of the camera, but I'll bet it is. And by using the torch, we can get this nice and hot. Just get it hot right where we want it. We don't have to worry about losing the rivet in the fire, but you can do these in a, a forge if you'd rather. Make sure that leg is pointed right towards the center. You get a little bit of a chance to straighten it here. If it isn't, very little chance. That rivet looks like it's gonna fill my depression just fine. Do that a couple more times. And remember, this is going to start getting hot as we go around, so be careful what you grab.
So here is the trivet as it stands now. Once it cools, I will check all of these rivets and make sure they're not sticking up too far. There's one other thing though that I'd like to do to it after I filed those rivets down. If you think about this in use and you've got something that fits, it's no big deal. But if you've got something kind of small and it doesn't really bridge over everything, it might tip in here a little bit. So I want to bring these points up flush. And I'm going to file the rivets flush if I need to. Then we'll heat this point right here with a torch and just offset it at the anvil until these are flush with the top. So I'm just going to heat that up with the torch where I want to bend it. At this point, I just want to get this warm enough to melt some wax on it and put my typical wax finish on here. Doesn't have to be glowing red hot, just warm enough to melt wax. Now, if you're going to actually use this in a fireplace or over the campfire to cook on, there's no point in putting any finish on it. It's just going to get covered in soot and grime from the fire, and you might as well just save your trouble and, and not bother. Things that get all sooty like that tend to be pretty waterproof anyways, and they don't really rust. But if you're going to use it as a display piece next to the fireplace or or if you're going to use it on the kitchen table to set a hot pot on or something like that, you might want some kind of a finish. If you use paint or a clear coat and then later decide to use this over the fire and it's going to get really hot, you're going to burn that off, it's going to stink, it might flame, it'll peel, chip, boil, bubble, whatever it is paint does when it gets hot. And that's going to be kind of ugly. It may be okay after it's been on the fire a few times, but if it's in the fireplace in the house, you really won't like that. So I think a wax finish, if you're going to finish it, or an oil finish is the way to go. And that way, if you put this in the fire, this will just cook off. It'll smell a little bit, but nowhere near like burning the paint off of it would. That is a completed trivet. It stands about seven and a half inches tall. The little spikes are right at the same level as the, the ring, so it'll hold just about anything you want to set on there. Even something fairly small could sit on there. It would balance okay. Really, I think that's a very nice project. It was a lot of fun to do. It's a nice companion piece for the one that was done at the conference. I think I'll clean it up a little bit, get it hot, and uh, wax this one too so it has the same kind of finish on it. I think that'll look better. This will end up on the Etsy shop, so if somebody out there really wants to buy it, it'll be available to buy. But most of the people watching this channel can go out and make one of your own. Still too hot to touch at the moment. But I'm rather pleased with that. I think that's a, a nice, elegant little trivet, nice project. Something you can have fun with. If your forge won't forge well, if you've got a little forge, a riveter's forge, brake drum forge, something like that, or a smaller gas forge that just won't get to welding heat, there are lots of trivet designs out there that don't require forge welding. It's not an absolute must. There are some that are done out of three scrolls that are 
uh, riveted side by side so that they form a, a nice trivet. And I'll show you one of those at some point as well. We could probably make 50 or 60 different styles of trivets without ever repeating the exact same design, but they do start to look all the same after a while. But we will do some more of these. They're a lot of fun to do. And if you cook over fire, they're extremely practical. But otherwise, they're not bad gift ideas, not bad craft show things for people that have rustic or country homes. Worth doing. I, I think you ought to head on out to the shop and you ought to make one. I do hope you enjoyed that video. Give it a thumbs up if you can. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. It's free to do that. Then stick around, watch a few more of the videos. There's links throughout the video, links at the very end of the video. Share some of the videos with your friends or on your social media. But then really, do get out to the shop, make something, whether it's this or some other project. Have fun, challenge yourself, but stay safe. Wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one. If you would like to provide financial support, to help cover the expenses of producing videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links in the description to both PayPal and Patreon. That is just a donation if you choose to do so. There is no obligation and the videos will remain free.